It is such an honor to come back to the University of Denver. I had such a formative experience here, like I'm sure many of you, and it changed the course of my career, much of which is yet to be written. I'd like to speak a little bit about my background, um, how I joined the military and the career that Kristen shed some light into, and then talk about the adventure of writing this book with General David Petraeus, and then um, draw your attention to something that's very near and dear to my heart, the status of our veterans right now and those service members who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, just so you know, um, um, we have the book in the back, but book proceeds are going to a wounded warrior group called Team Red, White, and Blue. And they use physical fitness to help wounded warriors sort of find their new normal, find a new organization to belong to. And I feel strongly that each of us can contribute in some way. Mentoring a veteran, finding a group to contribute to. Um, so I'll come back to that at the end. Um, I, I wanted to thank everyone that helped put this together. I think uh, Alicia is not here. She had to help her mother with something. And, and Sherry, where are you? Um, and everyone else that was involved in bringing this, this event together. And Chancellor for having the vision to bring this network back together, um, to share, to find common ground, to continue your education. I like that it's linked to the title of my book, The Education of General David Petraeus. And um, I wanted to raise one of my favorite quotes that I've thought about since I was in high school. It's by Alfred Lord Tennyson. I am a part of all that I have met. And that's so true for each of us. We're a part of the people that we meet. We're a part of the experiences we've had, the education we've had. And that's kind of how I approached writing the book about General David Petraeus' education, which hasn't stopped even now as he's the director of the CIA. Um, but I want to encourage you to continue to come to events like these, to share with each other, and to encourage each other to, to uh, expand your horizons, get outside your comfort zone, and continue to learn. So why did I join the military? When I was born in 1972, women only made up 1.8% of the United States military. Now we make up about 15%. But I remember in high school watching the first Gulf War on... on I was going to say unravel, <laughs> but uh, reveal itself. And I spoke to a group of students today, none of whom were old enough to really remember it, but thankfully this crowd probably can. But do, do you remember the shock and awe campaign? That war was over in a couple of days. And I was thinking as a young high school student, um, first that I really wanted to become a diplomat and get into international affairs, but I watched the war and I thought, as a woman, if I can understand that instrument of power, the military that could conduct this war, and stop this tyrant, Saddam Hussein, I could be a better diplomat or whatever it was I was going to pursue. So I got a wild and crazy idea to apply to the Air Force Academy. Now, mind you, I grew up in North Dakota. And growing up, I thought West Point was in North Dakota. I didn't really know what it was. Very removed from, from the military. I had applied to Georgetown and been accepted. And so that was the course I was going to go. But I went through the whole process of applying to a military academy. You have to get psychological testing. There's physical fitness tests. And you have to get a nomination from a senator or a congressman or the vice president or president. And I was kind of going through the motions. I, I, the idea of joining the military kind of softened after I got into school and thought more about um, being an ambassador. But once you go through so much effort, to apply for something like that, um, you really start to question, should I, should I go all the way or just cut my losses? Well, I was sitting in front of my senator, and I had driven back from our high school state basketball championship before the championship game, uh, which we were in. And I sat with him, and he said, Paula, you showed leadership qualities. You were state student council president and, and orchestra concert mistress and lots of great stuff. And you said you wanted to get into international diplomacy and be a world leader, but you've never said you wanted to fly. I have three students sitting outside my door. It's been their life dream, all 18 years of their life, to, to be a pilot. Why should I give you my nomination to the Air Force Academy instead of them? So being very competitive, you can imagine my heart just sank. But before I could answer, he said, I'd like to instead offer you my appointment to West Point, the United States Military Academy the training to be a leader, to get into international relations, to understand this instrument of power. I'm sure I didn't use that term as an 18-year-old, but um, you will get all the same benefits, he said. And I thought, again, I'm putting a lot of time and effort into this. I just left our championship game. I can drive back and make it. But I think I'm going to go for this. And thus, 
sort of serendipitous uh, opportunity, and it changed um, the course of my life. So I went off to West Point and had no idea what I was getting into. We had to wear uniforms 24 hours a day, including pajamas. Uh, we had to march, and I had to get some additional instruction for that. It was difficult. But at the end of the day, I loved it. Women were only 10% of the military academy in 1991 when I entered. Now women make up 17% of that body. And it was the most challenging experience, as you can imagine. The focus is on holistic development of the individual, not just academics, like most colleges, but on physical fitness. Because as an army officer, your body is the ultimate weapon system. You need to be able to get yourself in and out of a dangerous situation and rely on your fitness to do that. But obviously, there was a great focus on leadership and military bearing and ethics and morality. And so I love that experience, and it really shaped my, my code of ethics, if you will. The mantra at West Point is duty, honor, country. And embracing those sort of values has been um, a guiding light in my life. I don't, I'm not mo motivated by making a lot of money, but I'm very motivated about trying to make a difference in the world in whatever way I can. And I think that this institution embodies that as well and tries to encourage um, college students and graduate students, at least that was my experience at the, at the Corbell School, GSIS at the time. In any case, after West Point, um, I went off to Korea for my first assignment. As you can imagine, coming from rural North Dakota, it was very exotic, and I loved it. But my first, my first um, interaction with my unit was kind of eye-opening. So remember, I just graduated from the United States Military Academy. I was very proud of myself, as all cadets are and all, all young graduates are, thinking we're the cream of the crop. And I was sent to meet my unit at the DMZ, Demilitarized Zone, right on the border. And I wanted to impress them, of course. Well, they, um, they were camped out for the night. They were deployed along the, the DMZ, listening to North Korean communications and jamming and so forth. And I joined them the first night. Um, I was camping out with them, too, in our tent. And after about an hour uh, of sleep, I was miserable. I had jet lag. Frostbite was sure to, to get me while I was there. But after about an hour of sleep, my platoon sergeant reaches over and wiggles me and wakes me up. He said, ma'am, look up. What do you see? And I'm thinking, oh, this is the test for the lieutenant from West Point. I have to prove my keen intellect. And so I looked up, and I said, platoon sergeant, I see stars. He said, ma'am, what does that tell you? I said, trying to think of a clever response, well, astrologically, it tells me there are billions of stars and planets in the universe, and we are but insignificant in all of it. No response. I said, theologically, it tells me God is great, and we must have a greater calling in life. No response. So I tried the military approach. Meteorologically, it tells me we're going to have a great day of training tomorrow. No response. So I said, platoon sergeant, what does it tell you? He said, ma'am, someone stole our tent. <laughs> so I never tried to be an intellect after that or show any, give any kind of profound insight, and I, I certainly won't tonight. But uh, it was a good wake-up call for young Lieutenant Paula Crams at the time. Uh, anyhow, Korea was a wonderful tour for me. I learned to be a leader in that small environment of a platoon of about um, 30 men and one women, woman. Um, after that, I went to Europe and was assigned to the headquarters of the U.S. Army in Europe. I was a senior analyst for the Middle East and Africa. So great opportunity for a 20-something-year-old to travel throughout Africa to teach Ghanaians how to um, do a search and seizure on a ship that may be taken over by pirates, for example. I uh, went to Liberia and worked with the embassy personnel to come up with a non-combatant evacuation plan. Went to West Africa and East Africa, a lot of tremendous opportunities that were eye-opening and very broadening, again, for a, a young girl from, from North Dakota. After that, uh, I served in Europe in various positions and got into the counterterrorism world, where I've remained ever since. And the work we were doing before 9-11 was obviously still focused on transnational terrorism. These guys have been around a while. Um, but I decided at some point, when my husband was deployed to the Balkans and, and I was in Africa, and then I was sent to Kosovo and he was sent to Africa, that it was becoming very difficult to start a family. So we both decided to leave active duty. My husband um, was a flight surgeon, a clinic commander, and 
we had decided before we got married that every other move would be the other person's choice, since we both were very career oriented. And he chose Colorado, he chose Denver to come back to the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center here um, to pursue radiology residency. And I thought, my career is international relations and counterterrorism. What am I going to do in Denver besides ski, which was, my, was a wonderful consolation prize, as you can imagine. But I didn't have to think about it long. We were only here a month when 9-11 happened, and I was recalled involuntarily back to active duty. I was sent off to join the Special Operations Command and um, worked on putting together terrorist targeting packages for our special forces who were doing infiltrations into North Africa, the Caucasus, Afghanistan, and other parts of the world. So I was using all source intelligence. Um, felt like a very important mission, and I did feel like I was contributing to, to the greater good. After that tour, I came back to Colorado, and guess what? Uncle Sam called again, and I got mobilized um, two more times. But thankfully, it was to the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force here in Denver. And it was while I was serving with the task force here that I thought I needed to expand my horizons and that the University of Denver, Graduate School of International Studies, the Corbell School, would be a wonderful place to do that. So I applied for the one-year program here. And let me say that it was a, a wake-up call. I had, this, had had an amazing experience, traveled and lived in several different continents, very worldly, but I had no writing skills, um, poor communication skills, very few analytic skills. And I realized that this was a very important stepping stone for me to expand and become the professional that I aspired to be. My long-term goal had always be, been to become national security advisor. So if you can't write, you can't analyze problems, um, and you can't speak very well, that's very difficult to get where you want to go. In any case, uh, the one-year program turned into a two-year program because I loved it so much. And I eventually ended up going full-time once I finished my, my tour at the FBI. And my experience here was enriched by professors like Karen Festi, who teaches in the Conflict Resolution Program. And Karen taught me something very important. That instrument of power, the military, well, we can't shoot our way or kill our way or bomb our way out of every conflict. Sometimes diplomacy is critical. And um, I learned some great skills in her class. I can negotiate with my five and six-year-old insurgents at home now. <laughs> very helpful. I actually um, became an ombuds person for Harvard University when I went, and that was because of the skills I gained in, in, in Karen's class and some of the practical work we did in the community here, negotiating the, with you know, the neighbors who had a barking dog conflict, for example. So I'm very grateful for, for those skills. Um, also, Nancy Petrie, who's here with us this evening, sponsored a scholarship for me to travel to the Middle East. And I went back to Jordan to study Arabic. And I was not only studying Arabic, but I was writing my thesis for the graduate school. My thesis was looking at when you can negotiate with terrorists. And I think I framed it as extremists. And I was looking at Jewish extremists on settlements and, and Muslim extremists in refugee camps and, and Hamas and, and some other organizations. And actually had the opportunity to interview Hamas members and travel all over the Middle East. I'd been there before on an exchange program as a cadet from West Point. But that was during a very peaceful time. On this trip, I was five month, or a couple months pregnant. And um, it, was, it was kind of fun. I ate a lot of hummus. You probably all had hummus. I ate a lot of baba ganoush. And my Middle East friends started to call my, my unborn child baby ganoush, which was cute. The good thing I didn't eat a lot of falafel. That would be kind of interesting nickname. In any case, I'm so grateful, Nancy, for that experience. And um, I was able to apply for something called the National Security Education Program Boren Fellowship, which also helped to facilitate my study of, of Arabic in, in the region. And all of that and those experiences and my professors who mentored me and former Dean Tom Fair really encouraged me that um, the skills that you gain in graduate school were, were truly essential for what I wanted to do next. So after um, we left Denver, we went off to Boston and I studied at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And that's where I met General David Petraeus. I'd never crossed paths with him while in uniform, even though he's a West Pointer. We had alumni events like this, um, just hadn't had the opportunity to interact with him. He came back to speak about the counterinsurgency manual he, was, he had drafted and was publishing and was going to use as a sort of guiding blueprint for how to quell the violence in Iraq. And if you recall in 2006, that war was at a nadir. About 120,000 US troops were dying each month um, around May in, in the middle of that year. 
I don't think there was a lot of public support for the war. I know that I, as a military officer, reservist at that point, had become ostensibly a conscientious objector, knowing that there, there were no weapons of mass destruction, the precedent for going in was wrong, and we had no plan for an exit. We needed a visionary leader. So you probably remember General Petraeus kind of became a celebrity leader at that point. And I was fascinated with this individual who could get the big idea right. He could communicate it to the public to garner support. Um, he could communicate it to the troops to show us how we're going to achieve our objectives there. He could oversee the execution of the implementation, which was very critical. And he could create a lessons learned feedback mechanism for our institution, the Army, Department of Defense, to learn from our mistakes and not make them again, because we continually did that in Iraq for many years. We were focused only on killing the enemy and not protecting the population. Um, but also to learn best practices and then to share those across the force so that we are, we are doing no harm, uh, if that's possible, in war. In any case, I started to work with him, not as, um, not as a military officer, but while I was at Harvard, I also ran the Jebson Center for Counterterrorism Studies at, at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. And I commissioned students to do research projects that would support his work in Iraq. When he came back from Iraq and the war had, um, the violence had subsided uh, for all intents and purposes, and I realized that there was an opportunity to write about this transform, transformational leader. So I proposed writing a uh, dissertation using him as a case study. And I wanted to look again at his education. What, was, what were the schooling, the educational experiences he had at West Point and at Princeton where he pursued a PhD and, and throughout the military through Command and General Staff College and the other schools that we have to go to? What were the experiences he had in Haiti, doing peacekeeping and nation building there, in Bosnia, conducting a hunt for war criminals, and uh, in other deployments that he had that informed his decision making when he went to Iraq? And more importantly, I thought, back to the network and the importance of, of the strength of strong and weak ties, who, who were the people that influenced him most? His mentors, his peers, but also his subordinates, from whom I think he got the best big ideas. Um, so I started to write this dissertation and had unprecedented access in part because I was a West Pointer, he was a West Pointer, but also because uh, we were both runners. And in the, in the introduction in the book, I kind of talk about how I, I sealed the deal with him. Our first interview in person was on a run. And I had proposed this because I knew it was a rite of passage for many of his former aides to kind of get in the inner circle, you had to be a runner. Well, I had run in high school, I'd run in college, um, I'd been a, a sponsored triathlete when we lived here in Colorado, so I loved physical fitness, but I didn't think he knew anything about me in that regard. So we went for a run, we started at the Pentagon, and I had my, my recorder. Um, I thought if I asked him questions that he had to give lengthy answers to, he would, he would be more winded than I was. But, he was smarter than I was. He'd say yes or no, or he'd just ask a question in return or say, that's classified, next. Anyhow, at some point, at about mile three or four, he started to pick up the pace. And I knew this was coming. He, it, I called it the boiling frog approach, because you don't know that the water's getting hotter and hotter. In any case, I realized what was going on, and I decided to shut off the recorder and race him. And I was told never to beat him. Keep up with him, and you earn, it's the rite of passage, but don't beat him, because He's a guy, you're a girl, and he's a celebrity, and you're no, you know, you're a soccer mom. Uh, in any case, he started elbowing me, and it was over. So um, long story short, I did beat him. We got, we got down to a six-minute mile pace, and I later found out that he was going through uh, radiation treatment for prostate cancer. So it didn't really count, but it was a rite of passage and a, and a great sort of rapport builder with him. So. After um, a couple of years, about a year and a half of just interviewing him on a few runs, but mostly via email, he was selected to go to Afghanistan. And I proposed turning my dissertation, which was about a third of the way finished, into a book. And I thought it would be this intellectual history. I wanted to chronicle the war through the strategic commander's eyes to show how someone at that level manages a coalition of 48 countries, how they give energy to the public and to their troopers. Um, how you turn a failing situation around, if that's, if that's possible. And so he was gracious enough to allow me to travel with him 
uh, on battlefield circulations, to meetings with Afghans, to private meetings with his staff, and out to the Hindu Kush and to the border of Pakistan to meet with young troopers. And I really tried to document in the book what his principles of strategic leadership were all about. I mentioned some of those earlier. One, get the big idea right. Two, communicate it. If the trooper in the field doesn't know that the objective is to take the hill, then he's going to sit in his tent and play Angry Birds or you know, sit on email or something else. But if you don't communicate that the focus is to protect the population, then our conventional mindset in the military is just to kill, kill, kill. And so communication was a big, um, a great mechanism, a great tool and skill that he had. And I try to, again, show that in the book. Um, so when uh, the, uh, the tour was about over for him, he started to go through this transition. And it was phenomenal for me to see someone at the end of a 37-year career realize that it's kind of over, even though he had this amazing position lined up at the CIA. And there's a story in the book about how that position came about. Um, again, he was such a, a war hero and celebrity and, and had been kind of heralded as, as the greatest leader in his generation of, of military officers. So a lot of people didn't understand why he wasn't selected to become the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Part of it was he has a very big personality and it was thought that he would resist whatever guidance was given from the White House. So he was told by Secretary Gates that he was doing a great job with the surge in Afghanistan at the time. I know Afghanistan is kind of gone south quickly, but at the time when the surge was there, violence was down by 50%. And we saw a lot of metrics that showed that the surge was working and that governance was improving, that there was economic development activity and so forth. Um, and Sec Secretary Gates said to him, you have made a difference. We're all very thankful and grateful what you're, for what you've done, but you have not been uh, considered for chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And so Petraeus suggested the CIA. And I think it's because he had a vision for the way the military would change now. We will no longer commit to large-scale boots-on-the-ground operation like we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan. We can't afford it. It costs $1 million a year to send a soldier to Afghanistan. We've spent $500 billion, I think, total on the war in Afghanistan. Wouldn't it be great if we spent that on education? And I asked that as a military officer who, who did believe in the mission there. Um, so he saw that war was changing from that type of operation to more covert wars, and that the CIA would be a place that he could still be in the arena, if you will. And uh, I can answer questions about what, what he, how he's enjoying that experience now, but suffice it to say, um, he's one of those guys, probably like you, Chancellor, uh, likes to be in the arena, where the action is, making a difference. And it's wonderful that we have heroes like that that put duty, honor, country before themselves, before their families, and they just continue to serve. So obviously it was a great experience for me to be able to travel with him, to deduce his, his life lessons, and to try to figure out how can we encourage other young leaders to, to be all they can be and to serve their country first. Now, obviously, another thing I saw while I was in Afghanistan is the valorous duty and uh, performance of, of our troopers over there. Um, I spent a lot of time embedded at the company level, going out on patrols with infantry troops. It was unusual to be in that position as a journalist rather than in uniform, um, but, but also a great experience. And one thing that we all know about that has happened because of these wars is um, obviously the loss of life. Around 7,000 young troopers have given the ultimate sacrifice. About 45,000 of our veterans, um, our, our war warriors, have physical wounds, amputations, multiple amputations. But 10 times that many, 450,000 veterans who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan suffer from invisible wounds, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, and, and other sort of psychological wounds that you can't necessarily see. They don't get a Purple Heart. Um, they're often stigmatized, and it's difficult for them to kind of reintegrate into society. So I have, um, I've taken the opportunity on my book tour to speak about some of their issues and to try to give back through book proceeds, through mentoring wounded warriors and so forth. And I ask that each of you, whatever your fields are, go back and look at how you can hire veterans, how you can get involved in wounded warrior organizations, how the university can help veterans to, to contribute here because I think so many of them are resilient and have amazing leadership experiences. At the age of 25, they've been mayors in foreign countries. 
They've been managing millions of dollars worth of equipment and lives, obviously. They're going to be our future leaders in our country. So bringing them into the university, enriching the classroom with their experiences, I think very beneficial for the, for the university. So I will stop there. I'd love to take your questions about Afghanistan, about General David Petraeus, about women in the military. We've come a long way. Um, or anything else. And uh, again, I want to thank the university for bringing me back. It's just wonderful to be back and um, familiar terrain. Next time, hopefully you can do this during ski season. <laughs> but uh, thank you again. It's a privilege to be here. We well, think we have microphones, so. One behind you there. When was the last time that we fought a uniformed military? <laughs> well, they're, um, they're wearing uniforms. I shouldn't laugh about this, but for example, um, they're wearing ours in some cases, right? They, some of these guys in Afghanistan. Um, well, the, uh, the Taliban do often wear uniforms, their own uniforms, but you're talking about a conventional war, presumably, and that's, you know, that's going back to Korea. Now, will we fight another conventional war? Maybe that's the hidden question in, in what you're asking. The U.S. military thinks we may, and so we will continue to prepare for what is called full-spectrum operations. We need to be prepared for a ground war. We need to keep our tanks in line, our artillery lined up, and our troopers trained to use that conventional warfare equipment. But at the other end of the spectrum, it's more likely that we'll face um, insurgencies and smaller conflicts. So trying to retain some of the skills that we've gained in these wars is very important. And even further beyond that end of the spectrum is cyber warfare, which our country is at war right now with countries that are using cyber warfare to attack government agencies, our banking sector, and the energy grid, and other infrastructure. So um, I don't think you know, a hacker or the Iranians or the Chinese or other, or other countries that have malicious intent to attack us in the cyber world, they probably aren't wearing uniform. And uh, yet, I would agree that we need to be prepared for full, full, full spectrum operations. I have a question about sort of the uh, social side of what our tr troops do in Afghanistan and other places. Can you respond to that a little bit? The social side? Uh, well, you know, building social structures, oh. those kind of educational structures, those kind of things. Sure. Well, um, the, these two wars have, um, in Iraq, after the invasion, the basic services in that country were destroyed. So. Um, when there was no longer a government in place, when the Ba'athists were, um, were fired and, and chased away or went underground, there was no central government to provide the pay, um, to keep the hospitals going, to keep the schools going and so forth. And a lot of that infrastructure was destroyed because of what, what we did. So um, many of our, our troopers focused right away on continuing to fight and stop the insurgency. This is in the early years of the war in Iraq. But also to reestablish those basic services. Now some had no experience. We certainly had no training. I never had any counterinsurgency training until, um, until well into the war. We started to update our educational system. It's unfortunate that we're not a more flexible organization like a university, but it, it's a fact. There was resistance to ever conducting a counterinsurgency again. So even though we were fighting one, we weren't calling it one for many years. But thankfully, some of our troops had been in Haiti and done nation building. They'd been in Kosovo and dealt with the same thing. After the invasion there, there were no basic services. Um, so first, you have to establish Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You have to establish the basic services, water, sanitation, food, health care, and so forth. And then you start to focus on economic development. And is, is that a job for the military? That's the larger question. The State Department doesn't necessarily have the capacity um, in numbers, so it became a job for the military. So we started, as the military does, to adapt to that and to try to teach our soldiers how to not necessarily um, start a ho build a hospital, but to work with NGOs and other organizations that had those, those critical skills uh, in, able to, in, in order to improve basic services but also get the economy running. So I write about in the book and I saw how some of these young leaders were focused on how can we get, 
how can we reestablish trade between northern Iraq and Turkey and Syria? Because we ha they had to get oil flowing again. They wanted to be able to sell Iraqi oil um, so that Iraqis could have some kind of income, right? And they're, they're working on how to attract foreign direct investment. How do you get the hotels up and running again? How to attract tourists? It, I don't think that's a job for the military necessarily, but it's wonderful that our troopers can adapt to that environment. So um, there, it, it, it was taught after we got into the wars, and now we've kind of gotten away from it again. Um, the question is who will do that in the future. Now the new model is to have um, small packages, small quick reaction forces go and do um, foreign internal defense, which is something the special forces community has done for many decades. But basically, you're not focused on nation building, you're focused on helping that country that's a failing state to stand up their own inter internal security forces and defense and police and so forth, um, so they can provide security so NGOs and other organizations can come in and, and work more on the nation building aspect. But um, there are great skills, again, you know, when I'm t talking about these veterans that have, have learned to do this, and they're in their 20s and 30s, um, they, will, they will impact our society in a very positive way in the future. With your um, desire to be the National Security Advisor, have you had a chance to visit with others, the, um, with Condoleezza Rice and Madeleine Albright? with the well, DU connection? Um, I was telling some students today that somebody told me this once and I was passing it on to this next generation to come up with my personal advisory board, a dream sort of advisory board. I may never meet the people, maybe they may be dead people, um, but people that I saw as role models. And of course, Condi and Madeline Albright were, were on that advisory board. I, I've met Madeline Albright twice. She wouldn't remember who I am. Um, I've never met Condoleezza Rice. Um, they're, in, in my social circles, they're both one step removed. It would, you know, but, but I think mentoring relationships are best when they're organic. And um, I just haven't had an opportunity to, to work with them. But obviously, truly great role models. Uh, another thing I encourage the students today to do was to study their role models CVs and figure out how they got where they want to go, which is why I was trying to have a conversation with you, Provost, about um, that position, because that's something Condoleezza Rice did before she went to become National Security Advisor. And it's part of the reason I chose to pursue a PhD. I thought that kind of background could help me. It's helped Maddie and, and Condi, if you will. So um, never had the chance to interact with them, but truly um, great, great role models and inspirations. In Iraq, there's a, sort of an internal civil war with the, the Shiites and the Sunnis and the Kurds. Is that prevalent in uh, Afghanistan? And uh, what are we doing to try to understand those different groups? Well, that's a great question. And we have a, a difficult time, we, the US government, we, the military, in understanding the human terrain, as we call it. As an intel officer, as a military officer, I'm taught to understand the geography, right? And you typically had guys in uniform that were the Nazis, or one group that was kind of a demographic that had similar goals. But um, it's very difficult to do the human terrain mapping in these countries. We still don't understand the full tribal network in, in Iraq. Um, Afghanistan is even more complicated, and they've never had a federal society there. So trying to impose our Western way of governance and so forth in, in a country that hasn't had it for decades, if, you know, there's no institutional memory amongst the living Afghans really about what it could look like. Um, and, and frankly speaking, this is kind of getting off the topic, but when you've been at war for 30 years, you, your entire society has post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's very difficult to work with that community. But um, the, the concern in Afghanistan is that if we have this precipitous pullout, um, we have a drawdown, we need to draw down, but it's, it's still too fast. The Afghan National Security Forces are not ready to prevent a civil war, and it is such a tribal society. Um, it will never not be a tribal society. We need to understand that about some of these countries we get involved in. But understanding how the networks work, um, how you can create alliances if it's at all possible, is, is critical. I, I don't have an answer to that. It's very difficult. But um, part of it um, depends on the leadership, obviously. Karzai is a Pashtun, and he favors Pashtuns. And so that plays into every thing we've done there, security, who gets named to be the security chief, the, the mayors and governors and so forth in districts and provinces, and um, it, it plays into who gets 
the contracts for economic development activities and so forth. So it's a fact of life that we have to realize. Uh, there are probably professors at this university who can answer that question a lot better than I can, though. <laughs> Back. Thanks for taking my question. Um, General Petraeus, in his new role, has a very difficult situation now in the center of the situation in Benghazi. Do you have any comment? Well, um, just to create some context for those in the room, um, as you know, the uh, ambassador in Benghazi was killed along with a couple of, um, of security agents who happened to be CIA uh, security paramilitary forces. That, that just came out today in, in Fox News. But um, the challenge has been the fog of war. And the greater challenge is that it's political hunting season. And so this whole thing has been turned into a very political sort of uh, arena, if you will. Um, but the facts that came out today were that the ground forces there at the CIA annex, which is different from the consulate, were requesting reinforcements. They were, they were requesting the, it's called the Sinks in Extremist, Extremist Force. A group of Delta Force operators are very, most talented guys we have in the military. They could, have, they could have come and reinforced the consulate and the CIA annex that were under attack. Now, I don't know if a lot of you have heard this, but the CIA annex had actually um, had taken a couple of Libyan militia members prisoner, and, and they think that the attack on the consulate was an effort to try to get these prisoners back. So that, that's still being vetted. The challenging thing for General Petraeus is that in his new position, he's not allowed to communicate with the press. So he's known all of this. They had correspondence with um, the CIA station chief in, in Libya. Uh, within 24 hours, they kind of knew what was happening. But if you remember at the time, the, the Muslim video, uh, the Mohammed video that came out, the demonstrations that were going on in Cairo, there were demonstrations in 22 other countries around the world, tens of thousands of people. And our government was very concerned that this was going to become a nightmare for us. So you can understand if you put yourself in his shoes or Secretary Clinton's shoes or the President's shoes that we thought it was tied somehow to the demonstrations in Cairo. And it's true that we have signal intelligence that shows the, um, the militia members in Libya were watching the demonstration in Cairo and it did sort of galvanize their effort. Um, so we'll, we'll find out the facts soon enough. As a former intel officer, it's frustrating to me because it reveals our sources and methods. I don't think the public necessarily needs to know all of that. Um, it is a tragedy that we lost an ambassador and, and two other government officials. Um, and something, there was a failure in the system because there was additional security re requested. But, um, but it's frustrating to see the sort of political aspect of, of what's going on with this whole investigation. Um, so the, the most recent news that came out was a Fox report by Jennifer Griffin. I got it on a distribution list I'm on, and, and uh, it has some pretty insightful stuff in it, if you want to look for it. Hi. I'm, I'm just, um, I just want your opinion, actually, on... Um, you know, there's this, all this media attention not too long ago about the sexual assaults and the cover-up of the armed sources for women. Being the mother of a young girl, um, I, I'd be hard-pressed to encourage her to, into the armed forces. Um, what's your opinion about what does the armed services have to do to protect our young women? Mm -hmm. Well, um, that is a, a tough issue that the military is dealing with right now, and it's wonderful that this documentary called The Invisible War has just come out, and it's an expose on the number of women that have been raped or sexually abused in the military. It's uh, about 19,000, and we think that's only a third of the cases. So that's really a tragedy and um, an epidemic. It's, it's critical. I'm thankful to say I've never had an incident in my career. I've never had any kind of sexual harassment. I'm grateful for the martial arts training I've had and, and also <laughs> um, sniper training. So maybe part of that, you know, I have a deterrent mechanism. But a lot of our young women don't. And so we've got to, we've got to help them. The big challenge is that in the military, if you have some kind of sexual harassment or abuse, you report it through your chain of command. Now, what if it's your boss, your squad leader, or your company commander who's just conducted this 
egregious behavior. Um, it's not fair to the woman or man, frankly. There are a lot of men that are raped in the military, too. It's not insignificant. Um, so what the military has done is try to take the investigation mechanism outside of a unit um, and create all these hotlines. And we've had these for a while, but you have to educate the troops on, on how they can seek help and so forth. So this brings the larger question of should women be in combat, where you're in an even more hostile, austere environment, and rather isolated, if you will. Um, women are in combat, and our ground combat exclusion policy is anachronistic. Uh, thankfully, DOD overturned a couple of policies earlier this year in January and opened up 14,000 more positions for women, but there are still 250,000 that women are excluded from. But do you feel like... Uh, women should have the equal opportunity of a daughter. Of course you want her to have great opportunities. But should they have the opportunity, if they're physically fit and mentally agile and so forth, to, to, do, to be all they can be? There's a lot of discussion about this in, in the military right now. I'm a huge advocate for women's opportunities. Um, having served in the Special Forces community and, uh, and, and uh, seen women perform on many different levels, I think it comes down to leadership. Uh, the leaders in every unit, whether it's a squad, platoon, company, battalion, brigade, have to set the right tone. And if a commander sets the right tone, then abuse will not be tolerated. If a commander sets the right tone, then women can be integrated and can fully have all of those opportunities. But you have to have the right leadership example there. Are we done or one more? Okay. <laughs> They're cutting me off. So, all right. Thank you. <laughs>